thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is um, Penn Engineering Online's admissions webinar. My name is Jackie Panto. I am the admissions recruitment manager here at Penn Engineering Online. And today uh, we have a great webinar planned for you. Um, we, we have our um, online Masters of Computer and Information Technology program, otherwise known as our MCIT online program. And what's really great about today's webinar is we have a very special um, guest presenter with us today. We have Professor Brandon Krakowski. And um, obviously, Professor, Professor Krakowski, um, he teaches in the MCIT online program. But what probably um, most of you do not realize um, is that Prof Professor Krakowski actually graduated. Um, he's a graduate from the MCIT program. So he has not only tons of information to provide to you about the program from a professor standpoint, um, but he also has a lot of information to an insight to give to you um, about actually being a student in the program and what it's done for his career. So you are really um, in for a great treat today. Um, before we get started, what I wanted to do is to um, give you some information, kind of like some webinar housekeeping tips. Um, first of all, the webinar is being recorded. So there's no need to worry about taking notes. Um, if you miss something, it's not a big deal. Um, within the week, um, couple of, give us a couple of days or a week, but this, re this webinar will be located on our YouTube channel so you can watch it over and over again, go to certain parts of it that you missed. Um, the good news also is that um, our YouTube channel is a great resource for past webinars. We actually have had a, a series of webinars about two weeks ago where we invited current students in every day. So those might be some that you might want to watch as well. But um, our webinars are a great resource to learn a lot about our programs and the admissions process as well. So this one will be housed on there very, very soon. Um, if you have questions during the webinar today, we want to answer them. What you're going to do is use the Q&A function in Zoom, type out your question, um, and then we have a team of admissions. Our admissions team is behind the scenes. They will be answering those questions, typing answers back to you, and then some questions will be saved for the very end, and Professor Krakowski and myself will be answering uh, questions during our Q&A session at the very end of the webinar. But regardless, be sure you type those questions in the Q&A function um, in Zoom. So I just wanted to get started um, just talking and giving you a little bit of gen general overview about our MCIT online program. Um, this program is truly a one-of-a-kind program, um, very unique program. And it's unique because it's, a, um, it's basically a computer science program that's offered to non-computer science majors. So you do not have to have any computer science whatsoever to apply to this program. Um, it's a very unique, very diverse program. Um, and what happens is it's a program that's made up of um, students that come from very different backgrounds. Um, we have teachers in the program. Um, we have uh, nurses in the program, doctors in the program, lawyers in the program, engineers in the program, music teachers in the program, whatever the case may be, actors in the program, just lots of different um, folks from different backgrounds because you don't need computer science. This program is designed for those folks that don't have a computer science undergraduate degree. Um, many people say, well, the program is, is, is young, it's a young program. What you need to remember is that the online program was built on the success of our on-campus program. MCIT on campus has been around uh, since 2001. It's ex extremely successful program. So we built the online program and developed our unique online program off of the strengths of the on-campus program. The other thing to remember is that um, it's really the same degree and the same program as the on-campus. It's the mode of delivery that is different and the way the program that is set up and delivered that is different. But it's the same diploma. You're receiving a diploma from the University of Pennsylvania. There's no mention of online or on-campus on the diploma or the, or the transcripts. So it's basically, it's the same program and it's that same strong, excellent program that's taught by our world-renowned faculty. The other point to consider is that um, the same knowledge conferred in our MCIT online program, it's the same knowledge as a traditional master's of computer science program. The difference is that folks that go into students that go into a traditional master's of science in computer science, 
they're coming from a CS undergrad, okay? Our students are not, but the same knowledge is conferred. So when you graduate and you really, when you get through our core courses in the MCIT program, you're at the same point that a traditional master's of science and computer science student is when they finish their core courses in their master's program. So the same knowledge is being conferred. Just you can take a look at here at some of our demographics. Um, we talk about the diversity in terms of backgrounds and undergraduate degrees um, that are coming into the MCIT program, but we're diverse in a lot of other areas as well. Um, right now, actually, I think we have even more active students, but we have around a uh, little over 1,500 um, active students right now in the program. So if you think about it, um, in 2019, I think our first cohort maybe had 200 students in it, and now we have over 1,500 active students. So it's an extremely popular program and growing every year. 56% um, of our students are not U.S. citizens. They're international citizens. Our students come from 39 countries. Love this figure. We have 42% of our students identify themselves as women um, in, the, in an industry that was uh, traditionally known as being male dominated. Um, that is a really strong number. And I love the ages. Our ages go from folks that just perhaps graduated from undergrad at 22, all the way up to nearly retirement at 64. So you can see the diversity of our program. And I think that's what makes our program um, so strong and so unique and, um, and even creative in, in, in what comes out of it and what goes into it, because there's just so many different types of people, which is great. Um, a lot of times we get the question on why a Penn online degree? What makes our degree different from other degrees that are out there? And there's lots of different reasons, but we'd like to narrow it down to three main reasons. One, our same world-renowned faculty that teach in our on-campus pro program teach in our online program. Um, it's not like we've gone out and gotten uh, adjunct professors to come in, not that there's anything wrong with adjunct professors, but we're using our same um, heavily, um, our, our same heavily researched um, faculty members, our same world-renowned faculty members are teaching in our online program. Um, so you're really getting um, a fabulous University of Pennsylvania program and degree. Um, all of our courses are asynchronized. It's an online program where you're really working um, a, a, around your parameters, around your schedule. Everybody has a busy life. So you can determine when to watch your lectures, when to actually do your, your problems or your classworks or your projects. Things are due within a certain time frame, but you can decide when you actually um, you know, want to do that. So it's fully online. There's no reason to come to campus. Everything is asynchronized if you want it to be. We do have some live sessions that you're willing, welcome to participate in, but you certainly don't have to, and everything is recorded. Um, and again, like I mentioned, the flexibility of the schedule. You design your schedule. You decide when to watch your lectures. You decide when within a time frame to do your work and to get your, your projects done and whatnot. So um, it's, a, it's a great uh, flexible program um, taught by the same world-renowned faculty um, that teach uh, in the on-campus program. And if I had to give one other reason why it's all of the support that our students receive, there's so much re support um, in terms of student resources um, and just all of us wanna make sure that you are as successful as possible in the program. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Krakowski. So um, it is all yours. Um, Go ahead. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Jackie. So hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, so I'm Brandon Krakowski. I'm the instructor for CIT 5910 Introduction to Software Development, which is the first course in the program. I'm also the instructor for the Introduction to Programming with Python and Java. This is an open course uh, slash, uh, slash specialization on Coursera, which basically serves as an introduction to the first course, 5910, and the MCIT program. So uh, I recommend taking a look at that um, at that open specialization on Coursera. Uh, a little bit about my background. So I have a bachelor's degree from Boston College. And then as Jackie mentioned, uh, I'm a graduate of the MCIT program on campus. Uh, I'm dating myself, but a bit a bit over 10 years at this point. Um, I'm also the research and education director at Wharton AI and Analytics for Business, where I manage uh, all of our research projects with students, faculty, 
and academic researchers from around the world. Oh, Jackie, can you go to the next slide? So a little bit more about me, uh, in case you were wondering. Um, I started out as a musician, uh, and then I worked in radio broadcasting and audio production way back. Uh, my experience in programming began with a tool called Adobe Flash. Uh, if anyone uh, recalls that uh, that platform, I used that for a number of years, and I developed a live web com conferencing platform for Big Pharma. I worked for a company called Med Conference uh, for about seven or eight years. Uh, that was the platform I built, and we used that for hosting all of our webcasts with uh, all of our various uh, clients. Um, I received my uh, master's in computer and information technology from Penn around 2009. And then I worked, uh, right after I graduated, I worked as a programmer at Penn School of Design, got my first job at the university as a programmer. Um, and then I worked as, after two to three years, I worked as an application developer for Wharton Computing. Um, I worked with faculty and staff, and I built uh, various uh, tools and, and platforms to advance student programs. Um, somewhere in the middle, after a few years, I started my own company, Bleak LLC. I was doing um, a good amount of uh, work on the side uh, consistently, and so I kind of just wrapped that up into um, a company. It's called Bleak. Um, I did programming, freelance application development, um, app development for a variety of companies. Then I transitioned into data and analytics, and I became the research and education director at Wharton Customer Analytics, which is now... Wharton AI and Analytics for Business. Again, I manage a lot of research projects, experiential learning, data analytics projects for students, for faculty, and for researchers at other universities. And then in 2018, I uh, became a lecturer at Penn Engineering. A bit more about me. I'm a bass player. That's me playing bass. Uh, I've been playing bass for many years. Um, I play a variety of styles, but prefer music on the funkier side. Um, I've been in many bands, traveled uh, quite a bit, um, and I also write and record my own music. If anyone's interested, you can reach out to me. I can send you some links. So what did the MCIT program do for me? So I worked in industry for about 10 years before I enrolled in the program and went back to school. Um, I was basically self-taught. Uh, so, you know, back in the days when I was, you know, working in Adobe Flash, that was just me interested in, um, in writing code. So completely self-taught, had a lot of holes in my knowledge, um, a lot of skill gaps. So I knew what I knew, became good at it in that role, um, but had a lot of gaps in other areas. So I had no idea about basic programming principles, even though I may have been using them, object-oriented concepts, uh, my ability to pick up other languages easily. Um, was not great. Um, and so it took me, you know, longer than it should have to write the code that I was writing. It worked, but it took me a long time to to figure it out. Um, I did have a good job. I was good at it, but I was sort of, I sort of felt like I was stuck in that role. Um, so what did the program do for me? So I applied to the program, got in, was super excited, was working while I was in the program. I, I did maintain my almost full-time job at that point when I was in the program. So it was it was definitely a lot of work. Um, it did quickly fill in a lot of my knowledge gaps, um, both on the academic side and in practice in my everyday work uh, uh, at my job. Um, helped me better understand what I was already doing, maybe correctly, maybe incorrectly, and why things were working or weren't working. Um, a ton of basic computer science knowledge, taught me how to think more analytically, logically, how to solve problems by breaking them down. It was more efficient. Um, my code was fairly ugly, even though it may have worked eventually. Uh, the, the program definitely, uh, just through coding more and more and learning more about the, the syntax and the, and the languages, gave me an appreciation for the beauty of code, writing clean code, um, understandable code. And then, um, you know, almost more importantly, it gave me the, uh, the leverage to transition into other programming and technology-related roles, taught me to speak the language, how to interact with programmers, how to manage other programmers, and, of course, gave me lots of connections. 
So here's a kind of overview of the uh, MCIT online curriculum. So there's six core courses. The first course, 5910, that's the course that I teach, Introduction to Software Development. Um, then we have 592, Mathematical Foundations, Computer Science. 593, Introduction to Computer Systems. 594, Data Structures and Software Design is sort of like part two of 591, right? That's kind of the second part. Uh, 595 computer systems programming is sort of like part two of 593, the introduction to computer systems. And then there's algorithms and computation. And then on top of the six core courses, you can choose uh, up to four electives from a growing list of available courses. So I'm actually looking at the list right now. I um, mean, everything from artificial, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, uh, software analysis, uh, database and information systems, uh, network systems. It just depends on uh, where you want to go with your education after those six core courses, what you want to focus on. Uh, let me tell you a bit about the first course, Introduction to Software Development. So this is an introduction to the fundamental concepts of programming. The first half of the course is all Python, Introduction to Programming, and then Introduction to Python. So we introduce a lot of core programming concepts that we actually carry through the course, even into Java, things like data structures, conditionals, loops, variables, what are functions, what can they be used for. Um, we, we do provide an overview of various tools for writing and running Python. So we get students coding quickly, day one. Um, and we use, again, we kind of expose the students to a variety of tools. So we're gonna use Jupyter Notebooks, we're gonna use Idle, we're gonna use PyCharm, some others. Then when we get to Java, we'll have, you know, we'll jump into some other, uh, some other tools for writing Java, lots of hands-on coding exercises. Um, and then at the end of Python, we do cover a basic kind of introduction to data analysis, data science techniques um, in Python. The second half of the course is Java. So an introduction to object-oriented programming using Java, um, an overview of Java syntax, Right, we kind of going to learn the, the new syntax and how it compares to Python. Try to compare it uh, consistently to Python throughout the second half of the course. Conceptually, very much the same. Uh, the syntax is very different. So we're going to write obviously custom Java programs. We're going to learn about test-driven development, how to write code to test our code, um, and then we're going to introduce uh, you know some more advanced concepts like polymorphism, inheritance abstract classes, interfaces, and advanced data structures. Um, and then we'll provide um, an intro to different techniques for reading and writing files, writing to files. We do that in Python as well. We do it again in Java. Um, connecting to databases with Java, parsing, manipulating text, version control, and then um, some advanced strategies for debugging code using uh, Java's uh, debugger and Eclipse. Generally speaking, the course material includes um, lots of produced audio and video content for high-level concepts, um, in-depth coding demonstrations and explanations, lots of coding demonstrations, um, substantial programming assignments in Python and Java every one to two weeks, um, kind of spread nicely across the semester. Um, the assignments, I always say the assignments is where the real learning happens. So you watch the videos, you watch the coding demonstrations, you read the slides, you do all of that, but you're going to spend the most time working on the assignments. That's where the learning happens. You learn to code or program by coding and programming. And so in the assignments is where the, where the learning happens. Uh, some short readings, additional background material, coding tips, uh, regular quizzes throughout the semester, one to two a week kind of general comprehension of the course material, uh, practice coding exercises, uh, practice assignments, lots of opportunities to get uh, practice, um, live and recorded recitations for review of the material, additional coding exercises, live and recorded office hours, open office hours. I host those, a few other TAs open, open, uh, host open, open office hours. And then of course we have private office hours that are hosted by TAs, uh, monitor discussion forum, um, basically 24 seven support. Um, and then, uh, Python coding midterm and a Java coding final exam. So kind of what is the, the course experience like? So on-demand lecture videos, right? Lots of content, watch it when you want to, 
when you can. Um, no real um, real time required sessions. So there are live sessions. The recitations are live. The office hours are obviously live, but um, not required. Um, uh, encouraged. Um, in ongoing discussion forums, that's the 24-7 support that we use at discussion for TAs, um, answering questions around the clock about uh, assignments, content, exercises, recitations, all of that. Um, depending on when the assignments are uh, kind of scheduled across the semester, we have weekly, bi-weekly deadlines, and then access to this large team of, of TAs in this, in this course, uh, an army of TAs. Jackie, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, actually, if you want to um, kind of talk about. The, yeah, uh, the absolutely. I mean, that, that was that was great. And um, when um, Professor Krakowski talks about an army of TAs, it really is. Um, it really is the case we have. I think our ratio is one TA to about 21 students, I think is what it comes down to 20 or 21 students. So um, like he mentioned, in addition to office hours with the professors, our TAs have office hours they do the recitations, which are recorded, and they are on that um, discussion forum answering questions, um, you know, and getting back to you when, when you get stuck on things. So the support is completely there. Um, and again, like I said in the beginning, our, our job um, is just to make sure you can be as successful as possible. And we certainly provide every resource available um, to do that. So um, it's really not like other online programs are. We do not. Online programs can make you feel sometimes, um, you know, out there on your own and a little isolated. We really, really do our best to make sure that you understand, our students understand the resources so that they do not feel that way. And that is being involved with the professors, the TAs, other students, our student affairs team. Um, and that's, you know, that's what this community here is all about. And that's what I wanted to kind of talk about um, now. So our community, um, first of all, in terms of communication, um, our students um, and our um, communicate with each other and with our students affairs team and whatnot through um, our main communication vehicles called Slack. Um, we love Slack. We use it here internally um, in our office as well. But there's tons of Slack channels and Slack groups that students can get involved with. Um, a lot of times there's Slack channels based on courses. So there's course Slack channels. There could be geographic Slack channels based on where you live so that you can coordinate your own meetups with students that are in your area. Um, we have a turtle group on Slack. Our turtle group are students that are taking one course at a time. They're taking their time through the program um, because they're working or they have busy family lives, whatever the case may be. So lots of ways to communicate and get your support. Um, you know, if you're if you're having a rough time, there might be other students out there that can help you um, and or, or or in the same boat with you so you can kind of go through it together. Um, but it's really, really a great vehicle for making sure that you stay involved and build those relationships um, with the community. We also have a great LinkedIn group, um, and you'll have access to this from the minute you become a student. Um, we have a student LinkedIn group as well. So again, great vehicles of communication for staying in touch. Um, in addition to that, we have a wonderful student run organization. Um, it's our MCIT Online Student Association, otherwise known as MOSA. Um, these students are incredible. They run different events um, and, and various different things throughout the year. Um, you certainly are welcome to get involved with MOSA. Um, it's a very vibrant community, um, and um, it's certainly a, a great way to, to stay involved. In terms of events, there's lots of online and in-person events. Like I mentioned before, um, students in, in certain geographic re regions, they will reach out to one another on Slack. They might get together for study groups um, or just for a social uh, visit, whatnot, but there's lots of different meetups. Um, in terms of, um, in, in speaking of that, also our, um, our faculty, our staff here, um, we tend to travel when we travel we like to meet up with students in the areas that we're going to. Um, our associate dean, uh, who was just in Singapore over the year, um, he met with a group of students out in Singapore as well. Um, so we really do try to coordinate meetups when we're traveling to meet with as many students um, as we possibly can. We also There's also networking events that are hosted um, online, um, different networking events. Our student affairs team will put things together. Students will put things together. 
We also invite our students to campus for various events. Now that, uh, thank God, COVID's calming down a bit, um, we were able to have our first in-person event this past fall. It was our fall fest. And it, it, um, we were able to invite all of our MCIT students to campus. Um, it was a three-day event. It was for networking, lots of networking taking place. Um, but it was also a, a learning experience. We did have um, various sessions that were run by our faculty. Um, so it was also some learning, additional learning opportunities um, and just lots of fun too, lots of social events. Our students went to a football game. Um, it was just a great way um, to get to know one another and to, um, to network as well. Um, also, regular webinars are held, so there, and those are usually a virtual, virtual webinars, obviously. Um, if, you're, if there's a new course that's being introduced or a new professor or, or, or things along those lines, they will have webinars which you're all invited to to kind of understand, um, you know, maybe about the new course selection or if there's any kind of changes that are being made to policy or whatnot. Um, those are usually run through webinars. So we really, really try to make a very interactive community, a very collaborative community. Um, and we really want our students to take advantage of that um, because that is part of the success of this program is, um, is the community um, that you can be involved with. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the application. Um, we do have a deadline coming up. So March 1st is our early admission deadline. So it is actually um, just a little bit less than two weeks away. Um, we're really excited about that. And, and we're hoping that you're all um, working on your application so that you can get them submitted for, for early deadline. Um, in terms of the application, um, obviously, our application is online, but there are se several elements of um, the application that you will have to work on and prepare. Um, one is the resume. The second is the personal statement, making sure you upload your college transcripts, your letters of recommendation. Um, there is a $90 fee. The GRE is optional, and the TOEFL will depend upon what, whether if your, pro your bachelor's program or, or a master's program was taught in English or not. Uh, with regard to the resume, you just want to make sure your resume is updated um, and it's geared towards showing um, all of those great things um, that make you a good student for the MCIT program. Uh, so if you've taken online work or you've done other coursework outside of uh, your, um, your transcripts, you want to make sure you have a section for that on your resume. That's important. Um, with regard to the personal statement, please be sure you answer every question on the personal statement. Um, there's a list of questions in that section on the application. You want to write a good essay, but you want to make sure that you're answering every question that we're asking um, within that application. As far as college transcripts, it's really important that you include every transcript for every school, college, or university that you have attended. So every college, every university, sometimes people attend several universities, they transfer, whatever the case may be, but you want to make sure every transcript is uploaded um, into your uh, application. As far as letters, rec rec letters of recommendation, um, we require two. However, we strongly urge that you seek or solicit for three. And the reason why is your letters of recommendation um, are the only element that's out of your control. They are due by the due date, but you don't control it, the recommender does. So if someone is late, um, you want to make sure you have a safety net and having three recommendations versus the two will give you a little bit of a safety net in case you have a late recommender. GREs are optional. You do not need to submit a GRE. Some applicants choose to cho uh, uh, um, submit a GRE. Um, that sometimes that's a great way of proving your quantitative ability. Um, showing your math and quantitative ability on your MCIT application um, is absolutely um, necessary. Um, you must show proof of quantitative ability. So if you haven't had a lot of math courses in the past, or maybe um, you had some, but you didn't do so well on them, the GRE is definitely an option, um, but you don't have to. It's not required. It's an option if you need it. Um, the TOEFL is required for everyone who is not a U.S. citizen or U.S. permanent resident. And if you did not graduate from a program 
um, that was taught in English, then you would need to submit a TOEFL score. Um, if you went to a college or university and graduated with a degree there and it was taught in English, then you can um, put that down in your application and you would receive a TOEFL waiver. And again, there is a $90 fee application fee uh, for the application as well. Once you submit your application, um, there is a checklist. You can go in and see the status of whether your recommender submitted the, re the recommendation or not. Um, if you're submitting test scores, you can go in and see the status if they were received or not. You just log right into your application portal and you can see your checklist um, and you can review those elements. The one thing I did want to mention um, is that you do not have to wait to see those letters of recommendation received in order to submit. You can submit your app. Once all of the other elements are done, you can submit your application. You can submit your application without letters of rec and without those test scores. They automatically populate and get loaded into your application as we receive them. So if you're done with the other elements, by all means submit, because then we start reviewing the elements um, once we have a submitted application and we'll wait for those letters of rec and we'll wait for those test scores. OK, you can see the deadlines all on the screen here. Our early application deadline is March 1st. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is if you are interested in the Dean's Master Scholarship, the only time you can apply for that is for early decision cycle. So the application for the Dean's Master Scholarship, which is embedded in our, the regular application, is due March 1st. If you're applying for the regular admission cycle, you will not be able to apply for the Dean's Master Scholarship. That only um, applies to our um, early application cycle. Okay, so um, we've given you a ton of information. We want to open it up to questions. So uh, let me just pull up the screen for questions here and see what we have. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And then we can um, take some questions. So. Um, this one looks like it's for you, Professor Krakowski. Um, the question is, could you compare the intro to programming with Python and Java specialization, the one offered through Coursera, um, with the MCIT online course 5910? Please address similarities and differences in content, speed, and exams. Yeah, that's a good question. So it's some of the same content. Um, it is a, a subset of the content from the course. So Imagine a subset of the topics covered in the specialization with exercises, but the assignments are completely different. So the assignments in the actual 5910 are the graded assignments once you are in the program and you're going through that course. Those are the graded assignments. The assignments in the specialization are um, much easier, but they do allow you to practice the topics that are covered in the uh, throughout the four courses in the specialization. So it's a subset of topics and it's completely different assignments, but you will recognize some of the content. If you are in the program and you go through 59100, you'll definitely recognize some of the same material that's being covered. So it's a great way to get an overview of most of, I think most of the material that's in the first course, 5910. But of course, you're not going to spend as much time on the assignments. Yeah, excellent. I, I, it is also, um, it, if you've never had or you've had very limited online experiencing experience, taking that specialization is really a great way, a, um, to show your ability to take an online course, um, because not everybody. I mean, online is different. Not everybody, um, you know, is good at taking online courses. So, um, and that is something that, um, you know, through the admissions process, we do look at. So. Um, and then not only will it help with that, it's going to help with the program as well because of the content for sure. So, yeah, I think that's um, it's usually a very positive thing if, if you're able to do that as well. That's true. You um, mentioned, and, oh, sorry, you mentioned the format. I should have I should have referenced that. It does give you a, a, a sense of what the format of the course is like as well. That's a, that's kind yeah. of an important thing. Like what's the late what's the structure of the course? How do, what do the what are the lectures even like? How do I absorb the content throughout the week like that is sort of practicing with uh, with the content as well. Um, so you get a sense at least of what the format's like in in the in the first course. Yeah, sometimes what I usually say it's um it's almost like a try it before you buy it sort of a thing too. Yeah. Um, both the specialization in Python and Java and our computational thinking and problem solving, the two open courses um, are, are a great way to, you know, 
there, listen, we want everybody to be happy. So you might take that for the specialization or the computational thinking and problem solving and say, oh, this is way too much that I'm bargaining for. I don't think I need all this. Maybe I just need a boot camp or something right. like that. Or others take it are like, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, right. This is perfect. So sometimes if you're not sure, um, it, it's a good idea to try try it out, so to speak, is what we say. I think it's going to be more a case of the latter. It's going to be exactly what they're looking for. I agree. Absolutely. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then we do have a question. I, I, I like this one. Um, somebody's just asking when you were in the MCIT program, um, how, and again, it was the on-campus versus the online, but how long did it take you to get through it? Like how many courses did you take, um, if you can remember, and how long it took you to get through it? Yeah, let's see if I can remember. So I was definitely <laughs> working full-time, applied to the program, got in, and I was uh, I, I intended to keep my full-time job and go through the program full-time. So full-time at the time was three courses, three core courses, fall, three core courses, spring. And I did that. The problem was the courses met during the day, right? Obviously. So I had to adjust my schedule a bit, um, at work, but I did maintain full-time work. So for, for me, it was, uh, quite a bit of work. I mean, I didn't have kids at the time, so, you know, I didn't have, uh, that additional, you know, uh, bandwidth being used for raising children, but I was definitely uh, would work as much as I could in the morning and during the day, go to class in the afternoon, and then just work on homework all night. And then on the weekends as well. So I spent a lot of time, I went full time through the first year, three classes, three classes, and then I took one class at a time for the last four. So I guess I started full time, but sort of finished part time. Gotcha. Yeah. And the, and the difference with, with, um, with, taking an online program is you, online students, you 100% can decide how many courses you want to take in a semester. Um, so if you only want to take one course a semester, that's great. And we do allow students seven years to complete the program if you do want to stretch out your courses uh, over a certain time frame. Um, or you can take three courses a semester. Or, you know, it, it's really up to you whether you want to do part-time or full-time. And with online, you can go back and forth. Um, if you have a, a job or a career where maybe the fall isn't as busy as the spring or vice versa, then you might want to take more courses when work is less busy um, and then cut back on it um, you know, when, when, when you're busier. Also, you do not have to take courses in the summer, but um, you're welcome to. So if you're taking one course at a time, taking a course in the summer will also speed up the process so that you're able to finish um, quicker. So lots of flexibility in this program. Um, and that's what makes uh, the online program um, very, uh, very attractable, so to speak. So <laughs> um, here's I'll, see, I'll just I'll just add this. This is like a personal thing. So for me, the fact that I was working full time while I was in school going through the program, it actually helped me be more efficient with my time and manage my time because I had to be. So if I had, if I wasn't working full time and I was just going to class, that would have been great. Um, I, you know, maybe take my time a little bit more. But the fact that I was working, I had to really be like so careful about my time um, and, and just managing my time. So the work actually helped me do that. Okay, I'm going to work in the morning. I'm going to leave it too. I'm going to go to class and then I'm going to go home. I'm going to eat and then I'm just going to start working on my programming assignments or whatever it is I was working on. So and then weekends all day, each day. Um, and so for me, it just helped me manage my own time. But everybody is different, you know, obviously. But that 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 personally helped me. Yeah, absolutely. I think the key is really having um, a plan and a schedule. And you, you're almost forced to be a good time manager um, right. when you have so much going on. I completely agree. Here's oh, another. And here's another. I was add one more oh, thing. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the other thing was I happened to be working a job that was related because I was programming it, it at my job. I was managing programmers, but I was also, you know, programming myself. So for me, I was able to uh, pretty quickly, like within the first year, integrate what I was learning in the program, the first few classes into my, you know, my job and what I was doing for uh, at that company. So for me, that was really like exciting. I could see it working, you know, like really quickly within a few weeks, I was like, oh, okay. I started to click very quickly struggled like the first week or two was really like oh my god this is this is crazy i can't do this and then within a few weeks i was just like oh it's starting to click and i was able to integrate that into my job that's awesome 
for yeah. sure. And a lot, a lot of students do say that they, they feel it happens very quickly. It's like a light switch and boom, they, they yeah. kind of take off with it. It's great. Um, here's another interesting question. Um, uh, the AI field is developing very fast and we see proliferation of code assistance, example, copilot, chat, chat, GPT, et cetera, or no code solutions. With this in mind, what are your thoughts on how the program should evolve and take into account these developments in automation? It's a good question. <laughs> so I would say, you know, for now, I can speak to the to at least to 5910. For now, nothing is being done. Nothing is being integrated because it's obviously fairly new. If you think about chat GPT and what you can do with it, um, you know, you can ask the tool to write code that does X, right? Write code that does this, but it's not perfect, right? So, and if you've never coded before, you don't really know what you're looking at. So I would say the, 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 um, the challenge is integrating it in a way, from my perspective, integrating it in a way that helps students uh, learn the learn the basics, like the foundations, so that they're able to work with a, a tool like ChatGPT, a so that they know what are they asking for, and when they get a response, for instance, a code snippet or something like that, they know what to do with it. That's I think that's the key. So maybe it's moving in a direction where you know I'm going to ask, um, and we're not doing this yet in the course, but we're going to ask ChatGPT to write some code, small pieces of code that, that we then have to put together into a larger piece, a larger program, a larger structure. And that still takes, that. then you still have to learn. You still have to know, what is this code doing? Is it correct? Do I understand it? And how do I put these smaller pieces together? You're not going to just ask the tool to write an entire program for you and then be done. Because then what's the point really? Then, then you're not learning anything. So I think that you still need to understand um, the foundation and what you're asking for and what you're getting in return to kind of understand, is this correct? Is it even correct? Do I understand it? If you don't understand it, it's, it's, it's almost um, not pointless, but it's, it's um, uh, less useful. So I think like to being able to, to use the tool effectively for at least smaller tasks that you can then, um, you know, again, put together into a larger, larger structure. Um, and and being able to understand what you're getting from from the tool, We're, we haven't integrated anything like that yet into into this course, but um, it's it's probably on the horizon. Gotcha, great. And then um, another question is um, going from a musician field to the computer science field. Um, what were some of the challenges you experienced preparing? yourself for the MCIT program? So that's a, that's a good question. So like in your, maybe like within your application where there's some things, do you remember anyway, that you had to do, how did you prepare for it? And do you have any recommendations for them, um, you know, coming from, you know, a non-CS field? Again, you yeah. are working in it obviously, but. Yeah, I was working in it, but yeah, I'd never gone, I was not, I didn't go to school for it. So, so I definitely the music continued. The music, the music went on. Like I wasn't obviously doing it for a living anymore. I wasn't, you know, earning that same kind of money. But the the music. I have to remember. Wait, I have to remember. Next time we're gonna have to. You're gonna have to play for us or do something for us when you do this. We have yeah, to make yeah. it musical. Uh, this is the one room in the house where I don't have an instrument, so I can't uh, actually uh, do that. I'll, but I'll remember I, that next time. So remember that, everyone. Remember what we I said. Planned ahead. Let's start over. Um, <laughs> so if I had something, I would I would play. But yeah, the music continued. Through, while working through school, of course, I found my my group at, in the program. They were also musicians, so that that always just happened organically. I always just found the people um, to play with, and then continued after school, and, and still continues, but less less now. Um, so I don't know if the music affected the preparation so much. In a way, it, maybe it, it maybe it helped because it was I don't know. It uses the same part, part of the brain, I think. Right when you're, I think, coding and programming and 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 mathematics, I think that's all that uses the same the same side of the brain as 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 art and music. Um, preparing for the program, I actually didn't do much. So I I was programming during the day, but again, I had like I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I didn't do any preparation. I didn't. There it wasn't the same back then. There weren't like lots of online you know boot camps. It wasn't a specialization I could go through to see is this the right fit for me. I applied. I got in, it looked like a good program. And then I ended up loving it, you know, within a few, like I said, a few first, first couple of weeks, I was, 
Um, it was hard for all of us. And then quickly, we just got into a, a real groove and um, felt, the, uh, felt the effects right away in my work. Didn't do anything to prepare other than what I was working on at work. That was probably preparation because I had some experience programming. I, I didn't come to it with no experience. I had no academic experience, no courses. I didn't have any, I hadn't taken math in, I don't know, eight or 10 years, something like that. So nothing like that. I didn't take any, uh, you know, uh, classes or anything like that, but I did have some experience coding. So that I think that probably helped me a bit. Yeah. And, and I think the, like you said, the timing of it too, this was going back to what you said, 2009, was it? Mm -hmm. I saw on the sheet or something like that. So, yeah. you know, we're talking about, you know, over 10 years ago. So things are um, a lot different now, I, I think. Um, and the speaking for the on both the on campus and the online program that is a you know pretty competitive program now. So um, definitely um, for those of you who are on here and you're preparing, um, the key ingredient, we review the application holistically, but the key ingredient would be that math ability or that quantitative ability. So it is imperative now that you're able to show proof of quantitative ability, particularly math courses. So that's what you wanna take a look at and then you want to make sure every single element of that application, your I's are dotted, your T's are across, um, and it's as strong as it can be because we do review every single um, aspect, every element of the application. So it, it's 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 relevant, it's totally relevant. But you got to remember, it's a different time. It's ten year, ten more than ten years later, um, and definitely, I think it's a lot more competitive now. Um, and um, definitely want to make sure you're showing that proof of quantitative ability for sure. So there might be more prep work now than there was back then is what I'm right. thinking, maybe, yeah. mm -hmm. for sure. We have another question. Um, this has to do with quizzes. Um, um, somebody's asking if the quizzes are synchronized or asynchronized, which they, you know, are obviously asynchronized, right? Asynchronous. Yeah. They are, yeah. they are, um, they are, you know, tied to the content for a particular week, right? So like maybe a, a week is like a module, right? Or a module is like a week. So you might maybe halfway through the module, there's a quiz. And then towards the end of the module, there's another quiz. Some high level concepts and then some, um, you know, answering questions about code or, you know, what does the following code do, you know? So there isn't, there isn't any in the quizzes, there's no like writing code per se, like in the platform, but you may have to like, you know, read code and run it yourself and find out what happens and, 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 and answer the questions accordingly, obviously. But yeah, asynchronous two about two quizzes per module. And that's really, um, I'm, you know, I'm assuming the quizzes are really there to help the student to stay on track and to make sure they're understanding the material, I would presume too. Yep. It's, and it's, yeah. and it's also a way of, of testing different things. Like, so the exercises in the exams are all the assignments and the exams are all coding. They're all coding. Right. Um, and the quizzes are the only thing that really like ask questions about other things that you may be using in the assignments, right. Conceptually, but like, there's no, those are the way of asking direct questions. Like, what does this term mean? You know, what is this, um, what's the definition of a variable or what is a, uh, uh, what is, what can, uh, how do you define a function, right? Those are things that you're using, but this is a way of ask, asking direct questions about them. So it does help you actually understand the material in a different way. And to, I think I spoke earlier about being able to speak the language. Like, what do these terms mean? Like, what does, uh, when you say variable, you may not know what that is before the before this course, right? You have no idea. Just being able to know what is a variable. Oh, it's basically you know something that points to a piece of data, right? Or a piece or a value or something like that. It's a pointer essentially. It's a reference to a value, and being able to like understand that and and sort of talk about it. That's the those are the things that the quizzes I think um, target. Great, excellent, um, and then. Um... In, in terms of exams, um, again, those are, um, from what I understand, are students signing up for a certain time to take the exam, like a certain time to take the exam, there's time slots, correct? So that helps with different um, time zones that they might be in. The, the exams are actually a lot like the assignments. They open on a particular day, 
and then they close on another day, but it's a shorter time frame. So it might be five days versus seven to 10 days. An assignment could be open for seven days. It could be open for 14 days, right? And the exam, midterm and final, it's, it works the same way. It's going to open this day. It'll close this day. You have the entire time to work on it whenever you want. So it's basically like an assignment, but it's easier and it's a shorter time, a shorter, shorter of a window of time to complete it. But it does cover all of the topics up until that point. Gotcha. Yep. Perfect. Um, we had a question. Um, I can answer this one. Someone uh, mentioned, um, um, can you take more than 10 courses in the MCIT program? So the MCIT program is 10 courses. Um, you really you can't go on and take more courses in the MCIT program. Um, if you happen to be in your last semester, um, if you only have one course left to take, um, because you're in that semester, um, I'm assuming you could probably take an extra course um, because you have to you only have one course to finish this semester. But what I did want to bring up is we have a dual degree program now. So for our MCIT students that are looking, um, to take more courses um, and are interested in data science, we have our master's of science in engineering and data science program, and we have a dual degree for that. What that means is any MCIT student, after they complete six MCIT courses, they can apply to the MSEDS online program. Um, if accepted, which is an abbreviated application, all you really have to do is write a personal statement. You need a 3.5 um, GPA or above. Um, but once you graduate from MCIT, so you still complete all 10 courses in MCIT, you graduate from the program, but then you can automatically matriculate and start the MSEDS program after you finish MCIT. Four courses from MCIT will transfer into MSEDS, leaving you just six courses to complete that second degree. So it's a great opportunity for our MCIT students. A lot of them are doing that now. MSEDS uh, is a, a new online program. This is our first cohort in spring, so we're very excited about it. And similar to MCIT online, MSEDS is built off the very strong on-campus program. So we're building it off of the strength of our on-campus program. So if you're looking at taking more courses, MSEDS online through the dual degree program would be one option. Um, we also offer certificate programs for MCIT alumni. So after you graduate from the MCIT program, we do offer some certificate programs um, that you can take as well um, if you didn't want to do the full, full second degree. So there are options to continue with your learning after the MCIT program. So that was that's also a great question. Um, I also have an admissions question here. It says, after you submit um, your... Um, letters of recommend. If you submit your application, are you still able to see whether your recommenders submitted their recommendation? And yes, yeah, so if you submit your application, you're able to go on your portal. You can see if your recommenders submitted their recommendations. You can see if a test score is submitted, if you're uh, submitting a test score. So that portal is very important to see and keep you updated. But the main thing is if you're ready with all the other uh, application elements, you do want to submit that application. So we are running out of time, but let me see if there's any more questions here. Um, just checking. It looks like we have answered them all. Let me just take one more look here. All right, I think we are uh, ready to wrap it up. So let's... Um, Whoops, okay. And okay, so let's um let's say we are uh next you get to next week and you think of um you know five other questions after this webinar is over. What do you do? Well, the first thing that I would recommend um is to go to our website and look at our FAQ database. Um, we have um, lots of questions and answers in there. Just type in your question, see what pops up. Um, but that that would be the first place that I would look. Um, we have a pretty extensive um, database there. Um, we have office hours. Um, you can sign up for private office hours. We have office hours Monday through Friday, every day of the week. And now that we're close to deadline, um, we have Saturday office hours as well. So Saturday mornings um, 
um, our uh, admissions coordinator um, will also have office hours. So every day, including Saturday right now. So if you think of more questions or if you have something that's very particular to your situation, sign up for office hours and um, we're happy to, to try to help you there. Email us. Um, there's, you see our email address on the, on the screen. We do our best to get back to everybody's email within 24 hours. Um, we are all monitoring our, our, our uh, inbox, so please email us and we will get back to you as quick as possible. Um, we talked about our open courses. We talked about the introduction to programming in Python and Java specialization um, that um, Professor Krakowski um, has done. Um, and we also talked about our computational thinking for problem solving uh, course as well. These are great courses to start with. Um, you, put, you can put them on your application. They're great to show online ability um, and that you've taken initiative um, you know, in, in learning uh, the online way. And these courses will definitely help you with the MCIT online program. So that's another thing to do in preparation for, um, for your application. So we have given you a ton of information. Um, hopefully we've answered your questions. I hope we've eased your concerns. Um, Professor Krakowski, thank you so much. Um, I, it was just great to hear about your course and the program and of course your experiences um, as an MCIT student too. What a, what a great bonus uh, that is for everyone as well. So thank you so much, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and hopefully I will see you soon and get those applications in. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.